This is a continuing education um, credit. And like I said in the previous, uh, before we started the program, if you will, please make sure to drop your full name, your email address, your AIA number, and we'll make sure to get you registered. So today's course description, we're going to provide an overview of builder's hardware, finished hardware choices, options, applications, and information for users and designers to reduce uh, misapplications. We'll discuss building code administration, laws, code compliance, and industry standards for providing security and safety measures while providing accessibility and emergency egress to meet legal aspects of a building and building design. These are some of our learning objectives that we're going to cover. So we're going to be able to understand the hardware selection process for architectural openings. Why are these, um, you know, we're going to be able to provide security and safe egress for zoning, regulatory code compliance, and ensure life cycle assessment, preservation, and reuse of existing facilities. Uh, we're also going to be able to coordinate related architectural items requiring finished hardware, analyze um, conditions and coordinate re uh, related architectural items requiring finished hardware for windows and openings to accommodate building form and enable efficient traffic control. We'll be able to understand that there are many elements um, to any entrance and finished hardware specification issues that have to be coordinated to provide um, preservation and reuse of buildings and provide architectural grade products for structural integrity, life cycle assessment, and soundness of the building. Basically, Whenever you talk about Division 8, you not only have to talk about the finished hardware that goes onto the opening or the door, but you also have to take into con consideration um, your HVAC, um, your compliance with life safety, ADA. You have to think about a whole lot of other scopes, paint, finishes, floors um, that are going to pertain to um, other, other specifications, but they're going to um, directly interfere with Division 8. So we have to keep those in mind. And lastly, we're going to be able to specify architectural opening hardware products. Um, known components or no components and terms to comply with life safety, building code and accessibility requirements for inclusion and in submittals and hardware schedules to enable equal access by users and owners of the building. So build us hardware. Builder's hardware is a, is a common industry term. A lot of um, folks also use the terms uh, such as finished hardware or just basic hardware, door hardware, things like that. But basically, these are products that consist um, of, or these are, these consist of products that are mounted onto moving parts of buildings, doors, windows, drawers, in order to move, fasten, and protect them. So builder's hardware doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to go on a flush door or a swinging door. Um, and it also doesn't mean that it's going to go on an automatic door, uh, a sliding door that goes into, like, say, a grocery store. But it also pertains to windows, how you fasten those windows, how you secure those windows, how you operate those windows. And it also pertains to drawers and safes and um, all sorts of things that are different than what you would normally see in um, just your swinging doors. So there's a there's a famous quote that uh, a lot of folks uh, refer to whenever they talk about builders hardware. Builders hardware accounts for 1% of total building costs um, on a project. However, they make up a whole lot of headaches. So that term, that industry term that people always use, and since our industry is so small, I'll go ahead and talk about it. We make up 1% of an overall building, but we are 99% of the problem. Why is that? I mean, is door hardware um, that hard to understand um, or apply or specify? No, but the problem runs in to whenever we try to apply that hardware um, to the opening and that opening has to be able to conform with a whole lot of other things. One of those things being, is our opening secured um, properly? Meaning, whenever we have that opening in the um, 
in its frame? Is it square? Is it true? Is that door hardware mounted properly? Is it installed properly? Are screws fastened too tightly? There's a whole lot of things that incorporate that are incorporated into a opening that have to be considered. Um, and, and for that reason, that's why we are 99% of the problem. If a customer or an end user or a um, or even you know a general contractor or even the, the distributor walks through an opening and they see that the knob is too tight, they go ahead and um, they turn that knob and they notice that it's sticking. Well, because there's a, an initial problem, we start to look at everything else. Are the hinges proper? Are, is the closer done correctly? Are the walls painted properly? Is the concrete done? Are the floors even? Are they level? Look at the um, look at the walls and how they're painted. Um, and so we start to notice everything just by walking through the opening and just from that uh, sticking door latch. So that's why we are 99% of the problem. But as we move through that opening, we're also a problem because we have to, you know, we are used for a whole lot of things. One of those things being fire and life safety. ADA. You know, are we aesthetically pleasing? Is our building um, high use or is it high abuse? So there's a whole lot of things of, um, to consider. These are the four critical needs of any opening that have to be considered. The first one being fire and life safety. Fire and life safety is going to pertain to NFPA 80 and life safety 101. We've learned these terms in some of our previous classes. If you need more information on these, please let me know and I can get you that information. But also, is the opening high use or high abuse? So what that means is, where are we putting this hardware? Who's going to be going through this, these openings? Is it going to be a high traffic area? Is it a school or a hospital or an asylum? Um, is it going to take um, high wear and tear because of cycle tests and things like that? Do you want to put a grade three uh, door lock or an exit device onto a, um, a onto a building you know such as a school the answer is always going to be no do we want to put a low-end grade one the um, you know lock set that barely meets the 500,000 cycle test um, that's required to meet grade one the answer is still going to be no even though the, the the hardware itself is grade one doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be able to suit that opening so you want to be able to talk to a professional and be able to put in a you know a type of lock or a type of exit device a type of closure that's going to suit the need of the use that's going into that facility now if we're going into a business um, office or a hospital maybe a high-end um, apartment do we want to have you know door pulls or locks that are aesthetically pleasing um, yes and so we have solutions for that those solutions also have to conform with life safety and fire safety but they also have to conform with ADA, and that's our last one. One of the top priorities to any of our buildings, not only is the ability to be able to safely evacuate in the event of a fire or some other type of emergency, but also to be able to allow everyone the ability to access and interact with the openings into our or through our facilities. So ADA is paramount to all of our buildings and we, we have to have a, um, an ADA path of use and also a, a life safety path. Hardware, why is it required? Um, these reasons are going to impact finished hardware selection. The first one being safety, NFPA 80, Life Safety 101. What, you know, why is it, um, why is it important to meet some of those specifications? Well, the main one is being able to evacuate the facility, but also be able to move through a facility um, safely and securely. Why is fire safety so important? Well, specifying hardware, which you know, going you know, going into a um, a fire corridor or something like that, specifying proper hardware to me in FP80 would mean that you have to have a door that's self-latching and self-closing. Well, why is that important? Being able to have a door that's self-latching and self-closing and also meeting fire safety uh, regulations 
means that whenever a door uh, or a, an opening or a space um, does catch fire or does have an emergency via smoke or something along those lines, that door, whenever it is self-latched and self-closed, will limit the spread of that smoke or that fire until life safety personnel can get to it and, and put it out, saving uh, not only the building, but also countless lives that go into that and interact with that uh, building. Security. So <clears throat> even though fire um, is important to our, you know, to NFPA 80 and life safety, security is also very important. Um, we've started to encounter a whole lot of security needs um, through the last decade that um, requires our openings to help maintain and protect people that are inside buildings. Um, that would be lockdown hardware, that'd be electrified access control and things of that nature. Barrier free access, you find these in a couple states where you have a limitation on the force that's required to open and operate an opening. HVAC control. So whenever we start to look at um, ASHRA specifications and their in their building code, which is your environmental code, you have HVAC control, controlling um, you know climatized air from moving from one space to another, and also limiting you know sun or cold from the exterior going through a um, going through a, a door and interacting with climatized air on the inside, and also pressurization. Fire and smoke containment, we talked about that earlier. Com and below that, complying with fire and life safety codes and complying with building codes. Check your local jurisdiction before making any decision on which code you are gonna be fire, uh, following. So finish hardware items. These are some of the categories that we will interact with um, when talking about finished hardware. There's a long list here. I'll just hit on a couple of them. Swinging doors, which is gonna be some of the most common that you're gonna be, going be interacting with your building. And these will include you know, flush doors that um, go into any office space or any um, hospital space going through corridors and things like that. Automatic doors, automatic doors that are both swinging and sliding. This could be going into a grocery store or uh, sliding doors that go through from an elevator going through to a corridor in a hospital. If you notice this at um, one of the main spaces that you'll notice it in our area will be at a local hospital called the Denver VA Medical Center. As you interact with any floor in the building, you not only go through an elevator, but once you go through that elevator, you then have to go through a set of sliding automatic doors, revolving doors. So going into any space, whether it be a restaurant or a hotel, a hospital, you interact with revolving doors. These are doors that go in a circle. Um, operable partitions, um, the, the ability to divide rooms. Um, you'll have door hardware that interacts with those, whether it be at the top and the bottom only, or even um, being able to lock those operable partitions. Storefront doors, storefront openings, these are going to be not these are going to be swinging doors, but they also could be sliding doors. But storefront doors are going to be uh, most commonly found at exteriors of spaces, but they can also be found at interiors. Exterior gates, um, these are most commonly found in apartment complexes, and so on and so forth. So typical hardware product categories that you'll interact with. What does it look like? How is it going to be finished and what is the base material? Base material is very important, whether it be interior or exterior. If you have an exterior opening and you have a ferrous material going into that uh, or ferrous material interacting with that opening, you're going to have a whole lot of problems with rusting and durability of that um, hardware, whether it be on your hinges, your closer, or even your exit device or lock set. Hinges and pivots, you know, what are we going to be using? Are we going to be using a pivot hinge? which is at the top and at the bottom of the opening, are we gonna be using a continuous hinge or are we just gonna be using a standard ball bearing um, hinge? Lock sets, grade one, grade two, grade three. Uh, what type of lock set are we using? Are we using a board lock? Are we using a tubular lock? Um, a board lock, the difference between a board lock and a tubular lock is gonna be the um, screws that interact with um, that lock at the face of the um, opening. 
are they at the are they on the outside of the bore or are they going to be in, on the inside of the bore cylinders how is it keyed how are we going to interact with the keying how's our inter, how's our locksmith going to interact with the keying and how's that building going to be rekeyed once it once it's done closers protection plates we're going to move through every one of these categories but keep in mind it's not just about locking the door closing the door and securing the door um, or, and hanging the door, there's a whole lot that's involved in each one of these pieces that have to be um, that have to be specified. So critical selection influences. If we have a 45 minute rated door or a 90 minute rated door, can we have hardware that is non rated? The answer is no. Um, so do we have to have the door? Uh, does it have to be labeled? The answer is going to be yes. So we have to make sure that if we are if we have a UL labeled and listed door, we also have to have a UL labeled and listed closer and lock set and hinges and kick plate. Um, so check local jurisdiction, make sure that you're following all those and you're in compliance um, when selecting that hardware. Is the opening non labeled? We have a whole lot more variation whenever the door is non labeled of what we can do, how it closes, how it interacts, how it latches um, with the opening and things like that. Is it in a path of egress? If it is, if it's a pair of doors, how do we specify that pair of doors to where it allows for the path of egress? Um, do we, can we put a mullion in the center of a five foot opening pair? Keep in mind that we have life safety code. We have to allow, you know, three foot for ADA. So Keep in mind that one opening will have to be uh, more than 32 inches in width, and that's clear width. So a 36 inch door. Is it barrier free? Are we in a jurisdiction that requires five pounds of, of force to be able to open and latch that door? Um, our, our jurisdiction where I am says no, but there are jurisdictions out there uh, like California <clears throat> that says yes. And what that means is whenever we operate our exit device, five pounds of force operate the exit device, five pounds of force to push open that door, and then five pounds of force to make sure that it latches. What happens when you have a barrier free opening that, inter that, it, that is interfered with um, the HVAC system? A lot of times you have a problem. So keep that in mind as well whenever specifying hardware. Building security. Do we have any lockdown priorities at the exteriors if we're in a school or in a hospital or in a mosque or in a religious facility? Keep those things in mind. Do we want to limit access to a certain opening, maybe a um, pharmacy um, or a storage closet in a pharmacy, something along those lines? Life safety, this will be NFPA 101, code compliance. And if we don't have the answer to any of those, how do we find it? Well, we use technical resources and we, we reach out to professionals. DHI is a great resource. DHI is, DHI is the Door and Hardware Institute. Um, with DHI, they have a whole lot of technical resources um, that can be used to solve a whole lot of issues. But if we can't uh, find what we're looking for there, reach out to a local professional. Uh, maybe um, your your local spec writer at your firm or even a sales representative. Most of us don't know anything other than selling hardware. But reach out to them and try to find any information that you can uh, to get the answers that you need. So after knowing the finishes and you know what it what it looks like, what it feels like, where does this material go? This is a basic list or a basic look at, um, let's say this is in a school, leaving a um, classroom. What you see here starting out is our closer. This, this is going to allow you to um, swing the door. Then you look at our exit device. That's going to secure our door. You have flat goods at the bottom. That's your kick plate uh, or your protection plate. At this closer, 
does it have um, the ability to be held open, whether it be electronically um, held open or mechanically held open? If this closer has a mag uh, a magnetic hold open, you would see it on a track, but it could also have a hold open via magnetic uh, on the on the wall that that it opens into, or it could be mechanically held open right here at the um, arm itself. Um, very closely, you see the strike that interacts with this exit device, but it also could be a strike that is on a lock set. Um, so we, we don't have to be limited to just this exit device. This is just showing you the basics. So what you'll find in DHI is a quick process on how we specify material. And so whenever um, people that have been trained via DHI specify a, um, a hardware set, you'll notice that it goes from hanging a door to securing that door, to controlling the door, and then protecting the door lastly. Protecting the door, you know, might be the last one on the list that you saw previously, but also don't forget, um, there's a lot of local jurisdictions out there. The IBC, uh, the, the, the last I, IBC um, iteration says that we now have to put smoke gasketing on in our corridors and things like that to limit the um, transfer of smoke. So make sure that you are gasketing your door as well, if required. So let's talk about hanging the door. Pivots. Um, there's a, a, a wide variation of pivots. You see them right here. Um, some think in this one you see right here, these are offset pivots, but you also have center hung pivots. Um, you can do a three quarter inch offset. You can also do an inch and a half offset on that pivot. And what that three quarter or half inch offset is, is the offset of the door. Where it's opening and clearing that space. You can also have butt hinges, which you see in this one right here. And lastly, you'll see a continuous hinge, which is this one right here. Continuous gear hinge. Um, the one good thing that I'll say about a continuous gear hinge, which there's a whole lot of good things to say about a continuous gear hinge, Hinge. But the main thing that I'll say about a continuous gear hinge is that it um, it transfers the weight of a door or distributes the weight of a door from the top all the way down to the bottom. If you're using a butt hinge, the weight of an opening is at the very top hinge. So you have to have more reinforcements and you have to make sure that that butt hinge um, is thick enough to support the weight of that overall opening using a um, a pivot hinge, the bottom pivot of that hinge is going to be the one that is um, taking the, the brunt of all that weight. The middle or the inner intermediate and the top, the top pivot are going to be just transferring that, that, you know, that door, just swinging the door, operating that door, making sure that it's um, properly secured. But all the weight's going to be at the bottom. So the butt hinge weights at the top, uh, pivot hinge weights at the bottom, continuous hinge weight is distributed throughout the, the door. Now, the problem that you find with continuous hinge, if you're using a full mortise continuous hinge, is that you have to make sure that you downsize the door to accommodate that hinge on the inside. If you do not, you're going to have a whole lot of problems. So as we um, discussed in the previous slide, this is what those hinges look like. Um, these are uh, pivot hinges. This is an intermediate hinge. This goes at the um, middle of the uh, door. Depending on how tall your door is with a pivot hinge, you have to have a pivot hinge every two and a half feet of door height. So you have a bottom hinge, a bottom pivot, two and a half feet up, you have an intermediate pivot, two and a half feet up, you have an intermediate pivot or a top pivot, and then two and a half feet up, you have your top pivot. Depending on the height, you might have another intermediate pivot. Okay, so keep those things in mind. These are some geared hinges. This one right here is an aluminum geared hinge right here. This one right here is a stainless steel. Continuous hinge. This is called a pin and knuckle. Hinge. This one looks similar to a butt hinge, except for the fact that it um, it's a whole lot taller and it goes across the entire length of the door. 
this one could be a little bit more aesthetically pleasing than this one. Just depends on what you are looking for in your opening. This hinge, I will say, um, it runs out. It you know the the weight is supported via a pin through the center, and it has bearings. This one right here, just like the name suggests, it works off of a gear, open and close. Securing the door. <clears throat> this slide here is going to be talking about literally securing the door with um, cylinders and cores. There's a whole lot of different um, cores out there, but there are just a few. Sorry about that. Maybe you can see this better. This right here is going to talk about different types of cylinders. A rim cylinder, the difference here, uh, we have rim cylinder, mortise cylinder, and key and knob cylinder. The difference that we see here, a rim cylinder is secured at the very back of the cylinder with two screws. It has a, it has a um, tailpiece that projects out and goes through an exit device, okay, or a deadbolt. And so it will come out this way from a rim cylinder. A mortise cylinder has threads and it threads into a trim or a mortise lock, or you can put a nut at the back of the mortise cylinder and screw it on to secure it. A key and lever cylinder is this one right here. This one is found at cylindrical locks mostly. And what this does is it fits inside the lever, inside the lever itself, and it's secured, um, or it also uses a tailpiece that goes through the lever and into the chassis of a cylindrical lock. Now, <clears throat> there is another lever type that will accept a small format or a large format interchangeable core, and where you see that is right here. Now, you do have cylindrical locks and mortise locks that have a large format or a small format IC core, and the main use for this one, so the, the middle one is where you see the IC core. The top one is the rim cylinder. The middle one is the mortise cylinder. The bottom one is the key and lever cylinder. Sorry about that, Brian, that you can't see my mouse or pointer. I'll explain it a little bit better uh, moving forward. The interchangeable core can be removed and the core can be you know, transferred to other areas, um, making it easier to rekey, change keying, lock out somebody from an opening. Lock sets. So the top one that you see here, the top middle is a mortise lock. The bottom right is a board in lock or a cylindrical lock. It can also be a tubular lock. A tubular lock is not going to be um, found in hardly any um, Grade one levers, except for one. Um, for more information on that product, please let me know and I can get it for you. <clears throat> the bottom left is an exit device. And then one that's not shown here is a deadbolt. A deadbolt um, can be found in a mortise lock, which if you look at the top middle, you see a deadbolt there. That's This is a deadbolt that is a part of a, um, a mortise lock. But there's also a deadbolt that's found into a, you know, with a board hole, just like a cylindrical lock, and it works, you know, on its own. It uses a latch, a mortise, or a rim cylinder, mortise cylinder most often, and, uh, and a rose. That's a deadbolt. Next, we see some, you know, it's going to talk about exit devices. Here are three different types of exit devices, rim, surface vertical rod, concealed vertical rod, mortise exit device. In the photo at the bottom right, you see two different types of exit devices. The first one is a wide style, and then the bottom one is a narrow style exit device. So quickly to run through what the differences is, the differences are 
between these devices, all of these are going to be, or all of these are going to have the option of having a narrow style or a wide style. But the way that they secure is going to be completely different. A rim exit device, which is what you see in the photo, <clears throat> latches via surface. It's surface mounted and it latches at the center of the door. Most of the time it's going to be located 42 inches above finish floor. Surface vertical rod is going to latch either at the top only, at the top and at the bottom, at the top and at the bottom. Um, a concealed vertical rod is the exact same as a surface vertical rod. However, a concealed vertical rod is hidden inside um, a pathway inside a wood or metal door or even a storefront aluminum door. And it secures either at the top only, the top and the bottom. And then the last one is going to be a mortise exit device. Mortise exit device is going to be, is going to have um, a little bit of flavor from the rim exit device and also a concealed exit device. And this is why, this is why I say that a mortise exit device is going to have a mortise pocket that's concealed inside of a door and it's going to latch inside of the frame inside of an um, ANSI or an ANSI strike. The second one that you see is a magnetic lock that's at the very top. A mag lock is used um, to secure a door via electronic, you know, or electricity. One thing I want you to keep in mind, it is never recommended to use a mag lock at the exterior of an opening because a mag lock is only fail safe. It can only be locked whenever there is electricity. So if you lose power, that means you lock that that means you lose security. So keep that in mind when specifying your hardware. Here are some photos of some exit devices where you see where you see at the in the photo here at the top, this um, this bronze exit device here. This is a surface vertical rod. Less bottom rod and that term means that there is no bottom rod. At the bottom left, this is a commodity rim exit device. And as you can see in the um, photo here, it has you know, no metal covers. So the, the covers that you see are black and they don't even match the, um, the push pad and that's because they're plastic. The next photo that you see at the bottom right is a wide style rim exit and then a narrow style below it narrow style rim exit. These are different types of cylindrical locks. The one on the top left is a tubular lock. The one at the top right is a, um, is a cylindrical lock. And the one at the bottom is also a cylindrical lock. And there's a variance between grade one, grade two, and grade three. Grade one means 500,000 cycles. Keep in mind that there are a lot of manufacturers out there that will tell you that we meet ANSI grade one, but be wary whenever you're specifying those products because just because they meet the threshold of grade one doesn't mean that they meet the quality of high use and high abuse. Make sure to reach out to you know, a local specifier or a local professional to let you know the differences between um, a high use or an industrial use grade one and then just a threshold grade one because there are some manufacturers out or there's one manufacturer out there that <clears throat> is at 60 million cycles plus and then there's other manufacturers out there that are at 16 million and then there's you know one that's at 9 million and then you have some that are at 500,000 so there's a big difference in hardware uh, so keep those things in mind when specifying. Keen. Here are some considerations uh, when looking at Keen, and I'm going to rush through this a little bit so that way I can keep up with the slides. We're about halfway, but I'm about six minutes behind, so I'm going to go through <clears throat> some of this Keen fairly quickly. Think with Keen, some of the considerations that you have. Um, Will we need construction cores and construction keying? 
Will the permanent keying be different than the construction keying? How will we specify the difference between construction keying and permanent keying? Well, if you're using interchangeable core, it's very easy to have construction cores that you go and plug into certain areas that you want to restrict access. And then whenever you're done with the construction process, you move through with your permanent keys, your permanent cores, and you just slide those into um, that space, removing access from your construction keying or the people that have a key for the construction um, you know, during construction. You can also do this with key and lever cylinders. Um, there's a, different methods, one of them being a spring method, um, one of them being a, a ball method. Um, make sure to contact your local distributor or whoever specifying your hardware to make sure that they get that um, get that right. If you need construction key, it has to be done at the front end, and you have to be wary of how you distribute those keys because if you give someone a if you're doing a key and lever system, for example, you give some people a construction key, but you accidentally give a person a permanent key. Everywhere that the permanent key is used, the construction key can no longer be used because it changes the keying and the way that the way that the tumblers are used, and you can no longer use those construction keys. So be mindful of how you distribute your keying and be mindful of when you want that to arrive, but also be mindful of how you want things keyed. So keying control, key uh, keying coordination, key scheduling. Um, make sure that you have a keying meeting prior to um, ordering any of your hardware. There's a couple of manufacturers out there that will hold a keying meeting, whether it be virtually or in person, and go through the plans and um, discuss your keying in detail to make sure that you get everything that you need correct and um, right the first time. Some of those things that they're going to discuss is, is it going to be grandmaster keyed? Is it going to be master keyed only? Are we going to have change keys for each opening? Or are we just going to have change keys, you know, meaning are we going to have two keys per core that we're doing? Or if we have a thousand of the same type of keying, do we just want to limit how many keys that we produce? Maybe a hundred of those keys or something along those lines. Are we going to have control keys? The only time that you're going to have control keys is if you have interchangeable core. That's your small format or your large format IC core. Electrified access control. There's a whole lot of different, or there's actually three different types of um, electrified access control. The first one being standalone. You can have standalone, meaning battery powered. You can have standalone that is mechanically powered or mechanically controlled. Then you have um, hardwired, and then you have wireless. Wireless um, integrates a couple different times. Wireless is going to be battery powered, but it's also going to be, it's also going to work with a front end hardware, just like a hardwired system. As you can see in the uh, photo to the left, you have standalone hardware here. This can include a battery powered um, lock set that you enter a code into or even use a key card to access it. Um, and then you have wireless access control, which is going to be battery powered. But it works with a head end software. To um, to control the devices. The big difference between the two is the is the are these abilities. With standalone access control. You have to physically be at the lock. To change the um, the code and to limit access to other people. Say someone is fired uh, and you want to be able to limit the access to that person. You have to physically go to that lock. Um, and either use a Palm Pilot, and in this, I mean, I don't even think that anything like that Palm Pilot is um, available. Could be. Or use a laptop, or use um, maybe even a key to change um, the code so that way it limits a person getting into that opening. And you don't have the ability of lockdown. With wireless technology, it changes things a little bit. From your head in software, you have the ability to change the code quickly, and also have the ability of lockdown. However, the drawback of wireless access control from hardwired, which I believe the next slide is hardwired access control, is there is some latency with your wireless access control, 
So if you are locking down your facility, um, you could have next to um, no latency where it's less than two seconds to lock down or less than 30 seconds to lock down. But with hardwired access control, it's instant. And so keep those things in mind. <clears throat> Here are some examples of some hardwired access control products that are going to be the dummy side um, of your of your access control systems. So these are going to be the load only. You have mag locks, which are fail safe only. You have electrified locks, which can be fail safe or fail secure. You have electrified strikes, which also can be fail safe or fail secure. And then you have electrified exit devices. The benefit of having an electric strike over an electrified lock set is the ability to run your wiring through your frame only. When you have an electrified lock set, you have to run your wiring through your frame and then through your door to um, access your, your electrified lock set. With an electrified exit device, you have a couple cool capabilities where the, the raceway is not very long. However, you still have to run it through the door. Um, with an electrified exit device, you have the ability to electronically dog your, um, your device down, whether it be through motorized latch retraction or solenoid latch retraction, but you have that ability. The cool thing about an electric strike is you have the ability to put it into fail safe mode, put it into lock, uh, I guess, uh, to fail secure mode where you have to mechanically operate that opening. But you also have the ability to monitor your latch um, so you know that if your door is open or closed or something like that. Controlling the door. So moving off of electrified hardware, I want you guys to, to know, which it should have been in the previous slide, this the fire life safety um, door closure that I'm going to talk about here in just a second is electronically controlled as well. So that could tie into your electronic hardware, but it's not electronic locking hardware, which is why they put it in your closures. <clears throat> you have a few different op options on closures, whether it be surface mounted, you see that you have a track arm closer at the top left, which is gonna be called a cam and roller closer. And then bottom right, you have a uh, rack and pinion surface closer, where you have a pin at the arm or a knuckle that controls, you know, that or it works as a lever to um, allow that door to open and then allows it to close. Then you have a concealed closer. You have these on a um, track or you can have them on a rack and, um, rack and pinion as well. And then you have one that goes into the floor that's mounted into the floor. These are these could be more aesthetically pleasing. And then the last one is your fire life safety closer. So say you're in a school or in a hospital and you want to hold your doors open um, in between classes or you want to be able to hold your doors open um, in a hospital in a corridor or even in a school in a corridor, but you don't want something on the wall and you cannot use a um, mechanical hold open because they are fire rated. You can use a fire life safety closer, which is this one right here. It's going to be more expensive. There's going to be more wiring, more labor, and the cost of the closure is more expensive. However, this gives you the direct ability to hold the door open. It's convenient, um, and you don't have anything that's holding the door open, like a, a door shoe thing or you know one of those door stops, excuse me, um, which is illegal for a fire-rated door, which you guys know. In the event of, a, of an emergency, lockdown situation, uh, fire, um, evacuation situation, these doors are going to release, close the door, and make them self-latched, uh, meeting the, the door code requirement. So ANSI grade one closers. These are a couple of examples. You saw these on the previous slide. The first one at the top is a rack and pinion door closure. These are most commonly found in, um, in the Americas. You also will find a track arm closure, which is the bottom one here. That's a cam and roller closer because you have a cam at, at the closer, and then you have a roller that follows that track that allows the door to open and close. 
here's a little bit more explanation on or uh, another look at at what they look like. So rack and pinion on the right, cam and roller on the left. Now here's the difference between the two. As you notice with the cam and pinion closer or the rack and pinion closer, weight disbursement or force needed to open that door, you have to have that force at five pounds. And then as you open that door up uh, with your back check, you're gonna have to put more force uh, whenever you open your door to uh, 90 to 180 degrees. With a cam and roller closer, you have that initial force that's needed to open that door, but then look at the disbursement going all the way to 180 degrees. It's very steady and it's very light, it's very easy to use. So controlling that door, mechanically controlling that door, you see a couple different things um, with your closer arm. Um, with the cam and roller closer, I'm gonna go back a couple slides. With the cam and roller closer, you do have the ability um, whenever you get to your 90 or 180 degrees to not only um, stop that door from opening, but also hold that door open um, with the select option. With your rack and pinion closer, you also have that same ability. It's just going to be on the door shoe um, of, the, of the closer arm itself, or it could even be found in the knuckle. To stop that door or hold that door open. So here's what some of those things look like. I wanted to I wanted to make sure I said that um, prior to jumping into this slide. So if you look at the very top left, <laughs> excuse me, the very top left arms, you see a stop at the shoe of the arm, which I'm doing my pointer. But if you look at the very bottom, um, you see a triangular portion of the closed arm itself. What you see there is a um, is a cushion stop. So whenever that door opens to 90 degrees or 180 degrees, wherever you have it set via your installation instructions, it will stop that arm from opening any further. So stopping that door. What you have on the one to the right is a hold open device. So basically, whenever you open that door to a certain amount, um, that door will then hold itself open mechanically. You can also do that if you're using a rack and pinion closer, you can incorporate an overhead stop with it to not only add um, the ability to stop the door at 90 degrees or 180 degrees, but also add in the convenience of a hold open device. These are not to be used at fire rated openings, however. The one at the bottom left, that's a wall stop. Now, at the um, top right, you notice what I just said, mechanical, mechanical hold open devices cannot be used at um, labeled doors, but you also have the ability to electronically, and I'll get myself out of this um, screen, you can magnetically hold open an opening by use of you know, either an electromagnetic closer arm or an electromagnetic holder, which is wall mounted. These are a pairs of doors, and what you see here are coordinator applications. These are this is typical um, hardware that you're going to see at a pair of doors, especially a fire rated pair of doors. So, at a fire rated pair in a hospital, which is where you're primarily going to be using this material. You have to have an overlapping astragal, which is what you see at the bottom right. But that overlapping astragal has to be on, installed at the inactive leaf of a door. So how do we do that whenever we have both doors open and they both close? Well, you use a coordinator. And what a coordinator will do is it will hold the, um, the active leaf open. So the inactive leaf, it won't matter how you set the closers, it'll give it time to close and secure itself with automatic flush bolts or manual flush bolts, but it'll give itself time to close. So that way the active leaf can close over the top of it. And say, if you're using a mortise exit device, it'll be able to latch into the, um, the inactive leaf, but it'll also be able to allow that astragal um, the ability to secure itself into the opening. 
and you know not hang up you know hang up and things like that if you have a coordinator installed on your inactive leaf and you and you don't have a coordinator if your active leaf closes first your inactive leaf will never be able to close because your your um, astral will interfere with that closing so it'll hit it and it won't close which means that your door is not self-latching and self-closing which means it's out of compliance combination of door coordinator with or without hold open um, the sleek architecturally appealing profile solves vertical rod interference problems astral coordination so if you're not using a mortise exit device and you're using surface vertical rods when using a coordinator you can have one door that's surface vertical rod and one door that has automatic flush bolts and you'll be able to again close that door use your coordinator hold your active leaf open once the door is secure your active leaf closes. Make sure that you have your closer properly mounted to where your last five degrees it pulls it closed, um, and then it'll, it'll it'll properly work in the opening. Controlling the door. So we're not only talking about latching the door and things like that, but how how do we get in and out of a bathroom or a restroom facility that's non-rated? Well, here's some examples of some door pulls uh, and some push plates. Protecting the door, moving into protecting the door. So these are going to be kick plates, door plates, um, protection plates. I'm going to move through these fairly quickly. So basically protecting the door, you have to have a smooth surface to meet ADA, but make sure that you coordinate that so that way you get the proper protection plate, whether you have a gurney or a or you're mopping on the inside of a door or you're just using it as the push side of you know for a kick plate. But you not only want to protect the face of the door, but also the edge of the door. If you have doors that are held open at all times, like say in a hospital, and you're moving gurneys through there and things like that, you want to be able to protect the edge of the door from getting damaged. So what you use there are edge plates. Here's some more examples of kick plates. So. The last one that I was talking about, whenever you protect the door, these are weatherization products, uh, weather seals, smoke seal, acoustical gasketing, and light seals. Hardware management considerations. <clears throat> so, door front coordination, often supplied by the manufacturer, but what you normally see, um, you'll see that door hardware for an aluminum storefront door and door hardware for common area doors interior doors they're all in the same specification they're all in 8710 and you'll see a distributor bid on the entire section so they will not um, discern between whether it's storefront or whether it's interior doors even though they are not supplying the storefront hardware they still might price out the hardware that goes on those storefront doors, which creates a huge coordination issue because you're getting over, you're going to get charged double um, for that hardware, or it could be supplied double, and you'll be having to send it back. Um, you might be, you might encounter restocking fees, things like that. So keep those things in mind. Make sure that you coordinate all your material, who's providing that material, um, and things of that nature. <clears throat> ADA. Earlier, we we're talking about protection plates. Protection plates, when um, working with American, you know, ADA Americans with disabilities, you have to keep in mind that they ha it has to be a smooth surface. So, if you have a surface vertical rod at a ADA opening, is uh, necessarily legal? It's not a, a smooth surface. So, what you have to do is you have to put a smooth surface over it, and it's a round plate that goes over that uh, vertical rod that then interacts with your protection plate. Um, giving that smooth surface so that way there's no hangups whenever you're moving through that opening. Make sure that you coordinate that with your door hardware distributor um, as they are professionals and or uh, coordinate that with your door specifier. So make sure that your power um, coordination is done. 
whether it be from you know low energy, whether it's you know low energy operators meet ADA compliance, operational descriptions and controls, but also high energy. High energy operators are a lot different than um, low energy operators. Low energy operators, you know, they, they require less force um, to hold that door open or push that door open. Um, high energy operators are very convenient, however, they will give you that additional um, pull or that additional opening force that might be that might be needed. Um, they're very convenient. They fit a lot of um, operational descriptions. But keep in mind the safety uh, requirements for that opening need to be met. And I believe that for the high energy operator, they operate very quickly and they operate 100% of the time. They require safety devices because they are going to close um, all the time. With a low energy operator, I believe if there's 15 pounds of force that's you know that's resisting it, it will go back into to hold open mode. It will open itself back up. Until that, um, until that presence is removed. Glass hardware. So glass hardware is a whole lot different than regular swinging doors because you're interacting with different material. You have to use something that interacts with different material. So a lot of the material that's used on glass openings is surface mounted and compression fitted. So preferred practice, electrified hardware. With electrified hardware, there's a whole lot of coordination that has to be involved um, with electrified hardware. You know, not only your door hardware distributor, but also your um, electronic engineer, um, the installer of that those electronic products. Make sure that you give a good operational description of what you want, how you want that door to operate, how you want it to be used at all times. Uh, what parts and components are going to be used at each opening, whether it be an electrified block, a you know power transfer, where's your power transfer located? Is it located on the frame itself? Is it located in the hinge? Is it just an electric through wire? Make sure that you use um, a, an accurate parts description so whenever coordinating that material, it can be done accurately. Give a point-to-point -point description of um, how the wiring is going to be done, where our wiring is located. You know. It, does it all tie in at, at the um, strike side of the frame? Does it tie in at the um, center of the frame? Does it tie in at the, the hinge side of the frame? Where's the uh, main power going to be located? Where's your power supply going to be located? All those things um, are necessary. So, as I just discussed, this is a an accurate description of what you know that operational description will look like. And also, you know, where hardware is going to be uh, located and how it's going to work, what type of wiring is going to be used at that hardware. This is from a, a Dorma uh, paired openings that looks like has a electrified exit device, some sort of actuating device, and then power supply at the head. So, some related considerations. We can read through that list really quick. Elevators, you know, are there doors, fire rated doors that are gonna work with your elevator room, your elevator closet to secure that space? The case work, how does your frame work with the casing that's going in at the base? Um, partitions, gates, access panels, electronic con electrical controls, revolving doors, everything ties in to division eight. Um, finishes. As we discussed earlier in the program, is it on the exterior? If it's on the exterior, we have to use a non-ferrous material, a non-rusting material. So is that material stainless steel? Is it brass? Um, what do we use um, for the exterior? Are the, you know, is it going to be aluminum? Um, how are the seals going to work? You know, are we just going to keep out wind? Are we also going to keep out debris? Is it sound rated? Um, all these things are considered. Hardware locations, where's the hardware located? Because it not only has to meet line safety, it also has to meet the ADA. So 
as you can see in your hinges to adequate or to adequately and properly install your hinges. Um, the recommendation is 10 inches from the bottom of the door, 10 inches from the bottom of the door to the center line of your hinge and five inches from the top of the door to the center line of the hinge. And then centered, your center hinge is equally spaced between the two. You need an extra hinge for every six inches, you know, in size um, to split the difference. Your lock sets, the minimum requirement is 30, 38 inches above finished floor. An exit device, 44 inches from the bottom. No, 44 inches. It says from the, yeah, 44 inches from the finished floor to the, to the bottom of the door. And I should say a push plate. Oh, I guess it's the exit device down there. So they're just talking about a push bar. So if you have a push and pull bar, 44 inches is the recommended location from the bottom of the door to the center line of that push. This will be a recommendation that complies with ADA and also life safety. For an exit device, 40 inches above finished floor. They're telling you 39 inches and 39 and 13 sixteenths of an inch from finished floor to the center line of the pad itself. And then a deadlock strike, they have 44 inches above, above finished floor to the center line. Make sure that you check your local requirements um, in local jurisdictions before specifying where material is located. I've seen a lot of manufacturers that use 40 inches above finished floor to the center line of the strike for locking devices, but there is one school district in our area that uses um, 38 inches above finished floor to the center line of their strike. So keep that in mind. So there's there's four different types of, of specifications. We'll walk through those really quick. As dictated by the CSI Manual of Practice, there's a descriptive, descriptive type, a performance type, a reference standard, standard and a proprietary standard. The first one is descriptive. As you can see um, below, you have an apple here. Um, it's two to three inches in diameter. It's deep red in color, and the minimum is a half inch stem, and it has to be attached. So it tells you everything that you need for that apple, but it just it describes how that apple needs to be built. As it says here in the um, description here, you know, there can be a lot of misunderstandings. The way that I um, see that stem being attached could be different than how you attach that stem. Is it attached at the top? Is it attached at the, at the side? Is it attached at the bottom? We don't know. What is deep red? Is it a burgundy color? Is it a cherry color? Um, there's a lot of uh, misunderstandings that can take place. Performance type. The same apple. Shines when rubbed on clothing. Tastes great. Gets points with um, the teacher. So this is good for avoiding the or equal product. Um, there's a lot of ver performance verification that's required. Um, and there's a, you know, extended testing. Let's find the required results and the criteria by which the performance can be verified. Reference standard. Um, so this is a citation of an industry standard to require to require product material or equipment or installation process or test method to comply with cited standard. So grade one, two or three. Just because I am grade one doesn't mean I'm necessarily grade one, right? Just because we meet the criteria doesn't mean that we meet the, the actual standard. Um, that, that, that holds true with our compliance of 500,000 cycles. Just because we're at 500,000 cycles doesn't mean you can put me in a school because I won't hold up, I won't be able to meet the, the warranty, and I won't be able to meet the quality criteria that's needed uh, to meet that grade one capabilities and the requirements from the end user. Proprietary specification. Specifically desired materials, products, or equipment by referencing the manufacturer's name, model, type designation, or other unique characteristics. Red Delicious is the apple that we want. No substitution. You'll find this with a lot of school districts that have a certain type of keying. Maybe they'll say that they have A1 keying, uh, A1 keyway from um, Sergeant Manufacturing, or uh, excuse me, A1 keyway from Best Manufacturing or a Sergeant LA keyway. They could also say that they have a Sergeant 10 line lock set, a 
Schlage in D lock set or at best 9K. Even though those were technically industry equal products, there's a whole lot of difference between those products and um, the facility might be proprietary towards one of those products um, because they want to fit the need of not only their building, but also the look and, you know, the look and aesthetics of their building. They want all sergeant locks. They want to be able to see our, all, all sergeant locks with LL lever and rows, or they want to be able to see all sar um, best 9K locks with a 15D uh, lever and rows. It just depends on where the facility is. Pro proprietary specifications using more than one manufacturer will assure your client competitive pricing. Obviously, three manufacturers listed for is preferred package bidding and architectural hardware. Whenever you use a proprietary spec, and you say, okay, we have a best 9K as our facility standard, but we also allow Schleg ND, Sergeant 10 line. If we are going in a, into a competitive bid, it will make sure that those three manufacturers are competing with each other to earn your business. Even though the facility standard is one, we're still going to compete to get your business. Here's what a standard hardware set is going to look like. And as we stated before, we hang the door, we swing the door, we lock the door, and then we protect the door. Wade, in the email that I sent out um, confirming everyone getting into the class, I also included a link to the PDF for this program. When I follow up um, after thanking everybody, I'll also include that same PDF so that way you have it for your use. But as you can see in this <clears throat> hardware specification here, we have manufacturer A using our BB1199 and our P hinge. We could also accept, even though in the hardware set we have the BB1199, we could also accept a McKinney um, TA2714 NRP or a TA2314 NRP. Um, we could also accept a Stanley FBB191 um, um, NRP. And sorry, whenever I said the um, TA2714, it, TA2714 doesn't come in 630. That's me being a hardware geek. Um, not trying to specify hardware, but the TA2314 is a stainless steel product, and so is the um, FBB191. So sorry about that. I'm not going to go through every product, but the main thing here is when you look at your products, even though they say this is the hardware um, schedule that we want to use, if the specification is open, we can change those as long as we are meeting equal products, equal to or better products, um, we can get you taken care of. Industry standards and associations. So some of the standards that we use are BHMA, Builders Hardware Manufacturer Association. These are for colors and finishes. DHI um, are going to be a lot of standards that are used. And you're going to see them in a lot of specifications. SDI, the Steel Door Institute. Um, WMA for wood doors. Support, lead, green documents. Um, I think we even have some others now. Um, whenever we are talking about... Um, environmental products and things like that, hardware that's declared um, and things. Hardware declaration. Sorry about that. So that concludes our program.